Lord God, that you come, Lord, fellowship with us as you have, Father. Continue, Lord God. Put your words and your spirit, Father, in my mouth, Lord. Lord, let the hearts hear, Lord God, that need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Get my notes out and see where we're going here. Today I want to talk about a just because kind of love. This morning when I walked in the church, the first thing I heard was Miss Annie making the devil nervous. And I enjoyed that. You know, it just, just hit my spirit, so I'm in the right place. It just, it's just a, a feel-good thing. Last Sunday in Sunday school, Spencer brought the lesson. And when he first said 1 Corinthians 13, I thought, all right, the love chapter. Here we go. I've heard this before. Now, I don't really think that way. I do immediately, but that's not... Have I gotten myself in trouble already? <laughs> it's like the love chapter. I've heard that before. But I come under and, okay, Lord, what do you want to tell me about love? Because I need to hear it. And I, I, I don't know it all. I do not know it all. And things that I do know I have forgotten and, and I need to hear again. But he said he was going to do the love chapter. And you know, Spencer's personality and demeanor it's like it just, it just took hold of that chapter, and it's like he was the right bus driver for that chapter. And he, he just worked that thing, and, you know, Spencer's humble, and I appreciate that. And he started reading, and I was sitting next to Willie, and I, I looked over at Willie's Bible, and it's opened up. And it's like my eyes caught the two paragraphs, first two paragraphs, and it's like I was witnessing the Word of God coming off the page and ministering to Willie because it touched Willie and I appreciated that. It's like here I am, I'm seeing the word of God work and it's actually doing something right now and I enjoyed that. Mrs. Johansson, my Bible teacher in high school, yeah, I had a Bible class in high school, public high school, 1969. But she made us memorize 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in the King James Version. Not only that, we had to get up in front of the entire school and, and recite it. So when I hear 1 Corinthians 13, I think of Mrs. Johansson. Uh, a few days ago, Missy came home and said that Jacob was on line with his class and they were reading 1 Corinthians 13. And so that just kind of adds to the, the impetus of what I'm trying to get at here. It's like, it's, like a, it's like a witness. Friday night, I'm laying in bed, and I like to listen to the radio with good music as I go to sleep. And they were singing a song called 1 Corinthians 13. I never knew there was a song. But I enjoyed that. It's just, it, it just mellowed out. Like when Spencer brought it, it just, it just it, it ministered. If I hear it a thousand times, it'll minister. And then I was in the bathroom yesterday, and I looked on the back of the toilet, and there's a card. It was 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> so what is this? And I had already picked 1 Corinthians 13. And then today I appreciated hearing that song, Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. So 1 Corinthians 13 Charles, I didn't have that on there, but if you want to throw that up on the screen and put it in King James, 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 1. And just to read it, because as I read it, and as you relax, it'll minister to you. Though I can speak with the tongues of men and angels, I'm somebody. I can speak with the tongues of men and angels. But if I don't have any love, those words are, are like sounding brass or tinkling cymbals. Let me give a demo here. Let me tell you how much I love you guys. Can you hear me? I really love you guys a whole lot, you know. A lot of what I have to say is that, and every time. You know what I'm talking about? See, I really do love you guys. And if I don't love you, really that's what you're hearing. And, and it's meaningless. 
I can say I love you, but if I don't act like it, and if it's not in my heart, you're not going to get any good out of it. You know, I can give my goods to feed the poor, and I can even offer my body to be burned, but if I don't have love, what do I gain? Absolutely nothing. I think two weeks ago it was on the news that this woman in Ukraine actually burned her body in protest. Well, she died. The Word of God says, I gain nothing. So what did that woman gain? Did they say nice words about her at her funeral? Did she hear those words? Where is she? How could she possibly have gained by burning her body? It did nothing for her. Do you like being around humble people? I do. I like just being in the presence of somebody who's humble. And saying that, I have to admit, I don't consider myself very humble. Maybe from time to time I'll act humble. But some people are, are humble out of their heart, and you appreciate being around people like that. I, I've told this a testimony one time. I was, I was driving to, to, uh, on the interstate, and I stopped at the uh, rest area in Walterboro. And when a man goes into a restroom, a public restroom, he don't say nothing. You, you know what you got to do. You get in there and you get out. You don't talk. That's just men don't do that. Now, I know when the women go in the restroom, they come out friends. <laughs> it's totally different. But a man goes in there, and you, 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 don't, you don't look at the guy next to you. You just keep your eyes straight on. Go wash your hands and get out. There's this one guy in there. He was a short, old fella. <laughs> I really enjoyed him. So it's, I didn't talk to him because you're not supposed to talk to him. But I watched him, and he's talking. He comes out, and he's happy. He's humble. And he comes out of there, and he... He's kind of shuffling like this because he's a real old guy. And he's smiling broad. And there was another guy in there with a T-shirt. It said something about Tucson, Arizona on the back of it. And we're all coming out of the bathroom together, not speaking, of course. But we finally get out there, and he, he looks at the guy, Tucson, Arizona, what's the weather like out there? And I'm thinking, D don't mess the guy, with, don't mess him up with the weather, it's his business. <laughs> See me, I'm quiet. I just go on back to my car, mind my own business. But I, I enjoyed this guy. As a matter of fact, I stood around a little bit. Uh, hear what he's going to say next. I, I don't remember the details, but I told you about this old, old lady. It was her 90th birthday up in Lumberton, North Carolina. I just wanted to be around her. I sat there. I, I hesitated, so maybe I could get to talk to her. I told you about that. I, I like humble people. God likes humble people. I don't know where we're at with the scripture, but if you can come on down, Charles. Uh, now, here's something personal just for you. What I'm going to do, I don't know what version I'm going to read. It's a little bit King James, a little bit Amplified, and a little bit me. But I'm going to fill in, the, uh, fill in this 1 Corinthians 13. Check yourself out. See if you see yourself or hear yourself here. And be honest with yourself. Love endures long, a long time. You know, when you have kids, you know that love endures long because you love those kids a long, long, long time until they're, they're grown and they go out, and then you still love them. But you've got to love your kids. Sometimes nobody else will. But love is patient and love is kind. Can I always say that I'm patient and kind? My wife says no. I know sometimes I'm patient, sometimes I'm kind, sometimes I'm patient, I'm patient because I have to be. But I know it's a virtue to be patient, and I try to be patient. Love is not envious. Do you, do you ever envy? And love does not boil over with jealousy. Jealousy, to me, is the color green. Just it's, The color green is like seasick. Jealousy is a, is a sick thing. Jealousy is not a good thing. It'll hurt you. It'll control you. It'll take you down. But love does not 
boast or appear as, I'm wonderful, you're not. It does not have an exaggerated opinion of itself. It, it does not have that self-importance. It's not inflated with pride. It's not rude or unmannerly. Missy was telling me about somebody yesterday who was very, very rude in public. I'm not going to mention it, but you, you see rudeness, and it's like it just, it, just, it just turns you. Love does not act inappropriately. It does not insist on its own way or rights. And at the end of this message, I want to really get into that, that it does not insist on its own rights or its own way. It's not self-seeking. It's not touchy. It's not fretful. It's not resentful. Now, every one of us have touched on one of those. And we know not only have we touched on it, but we've grabbed hold of some of those, and those things will take us down. Those things will own us. They'll lead us. They'll hold us. They'll captivate us. They'll ruin us. I saw a... Uh, I don't know if I've got, I, I had a, uh, here it is. I saw this Peanuts cartoon last week, and I'm going to share it with you. When I, when I saw this is not touchy, I thought about this. I can't show it to you, so I'll explain it to you. They're playing baseball. Lucy's out there. She's up to bat. Charlie Brown is the coach. He's the manager. And you hear, strike three. Well, Lucy just struck out. And then not a word is said, but you see the little thoughts that uh, Charlie Brown is thinking. And he's saying to himself, good grief, she struck out again. That's three times so far. I should say something to her. After all, I'm the manager. And, and she's sitting there with a scowl on her face, and he's sitting there. What should I say? Should I say anything? And then he's talking to himself. But if I say one word, she'll blow sky high. She's so mad now, she's ready to bust. I don't dare make a sound. Uh-oh. My throat's getting dry. <clears throat> no, that was me. That wasn't him. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't dare clear his throat. But if I make just the slightest sound, she'll think I'm going to say something to her. But I've got to clear my throat. I, I've got to cough or go, <clears throat> or something. My throat feels so dry. I, and then it just shows him his tongue hanging out and his eyes going in circles and just, just a fizzle of a thought. He doesn't know what to do, doesn't know what to say. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> and then she yells, I didn't strike out on purpose. And then it shows him flipping through the air, and he lands, and he says, we managers have a rough life. Maybe that's gone on in your home or in your office where you can't say anything. I just thought you'd enjoy that. But it takes no account of the evil done to it. It's not touchy. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness. It rejoices when right and truth prevail. I had a rare experience this past week. I've told you before, I read the newspaper, but I don't really read it. We get it for the coupons is what I'm told. But I'll go out every morning and I'll get it as an exercise, as a wake-up exercise. Missy uses the newspaper, the coupons. But I'll read it as if I'm reading it. There's just about nothing good in there. But this one time, first time in I don't know how long, there was actually good news on the front page. And I rejoiced because right and truth prevailed. Finally. Love bears up under anything and everything. Love is always ready to believe the best of every person. You know, like Pastor Bob says recently, if somebody tells you something about somebody, you may know nothing about that person, but now all of a sudden, when you look at them, mm -hmm, yeah, I know something about you. And 
maybe you know a lie about them. Maybe you were told a lie. It, it's, it's not good to listen about people. It'll bring you down. It'll break your fellowship with that person and maybe a person you don't want to have your fellowship broken with. But if you listen to a lie, it'll bring you down. But love is always ready to believe the best of every person. It doesn't weaken. It never fades. Like we sang, your, lo your love never fails. It never gives up. Never runs out on me. It never becomes obsolete. It never comes to an end. If anything is going to work, it's going to be love. So what is love? God is love. There is no love in the world except that it came from God, that it originated from God. God himself is love. It's his idea. It's what he does. And now real quickly, I want to take you through a whole bunch of verses and really just throw it at you and see if you can see yourself in these verses, starting with 1 John 4. I've got to read these. Wow, that's small. Beloved, let us love one another. Who is the one another? That's us in here, first of all, in particular. So anybody in here, if you're a Christian, you have to love everybody else in here because that's God's requirement. That's what he tells you to do. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested, or in this was shown the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. So God showed his love to us. He did something before we loved him. God sent his son into the world that we might live through him. Here's love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or to be the, I had that word written down, substitute. It was here and it's gone. But what these scriptures are doing is showing who God is. John 3, 16, everybody knows, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. If God said he loves the world, then you cannot not include yourself. You are part of the world. He loved you no matter how you think about yourself. You may think of yourself as lowly, as not worthy. That's not the way God thinks about you. He died for the whole world. Romans 5.5. 5. And hope maketh not a shame. I have in my notes that Christ died for the ungodly. So if Christ died for the ungodly, that's good news. Because you have to be ungodly for Christ to have died for you. That's how you start out. Is that 5-5, five, five, Charles? I can't read it from here. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly scarcely for a righteous man. Somebody might die for a righteous man. That's what it means by scarcely. Yet peradventure, maybe for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God showed his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So you can't earn your salvation. You can't get any better. You can't earn it. Because you were a sinner and you were ungodly, that's when he died for you. Psalms 130. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? If, he, if he's going to take a tablet and put your name at the top of a tablet and keep right, okay, well you, blew, well, you, oh, you blew it, well, you blew it here. Lord, I can't stand. I, I don't have a chance. He's not doing that to us. He's not keeping a tab. So he doesn't expect you to keep a tab of somebody else's sins. I'm going to jump over to something that happened this morning. <laughs> it probably happened in your house, too. Now, this is me. You know, I'm not perfect. I was ungodly. I was a sinner when he died for me. This morning when I got up, in the first ten minutes... 
you're going to think I'm bad, but you know, I'm going to share it with you just so, just so I can be honest with you and just so you can maybe see yourself. Uh, when I got up, I went into the kitchen and something wasn't available to me that I wanted. And I thought, you know, it's like, and, and I might, I, I didn't get mad, it's just like, you know, it's not a big deal. But it's like, it's like a rock. You know, I, you take a rock, you know, there's a rock. I got miffed. I didn't get mad, I didn't get upset. Missy didn't do anything to me, it was me. Something wasn't the way I wanted it. And then Missy said, well, I need so-and-so. And I thought, well, I need so-and-so. So there's another rock. And if you keep going like this, what you're going to end up with is a cinder block. And you're going to carry around a cinder block for the rest of the day. A few minutes later, I heard, well, I need so-and-so. And well, I need so-and-so. Well, there's another one. And then I went out to the workshop to get my lesson, and the door was locked. Missy had just been out there. The door was locked. <laughs> so I got to go back in and get the key. And then I came back in. I had to use the bathroom. And Missy said, I, I thought you were outside. I was, but I got the call. <laughs> so every day, we can build this thing up every day by these little tiny things, the little foxes that spoil the grapes. Now, she didn't do nothing to me today. I did it to me. And I had a choice each time to get, like I said, not mad, miffed. I don't know what that means, but it sounds like it fits. <laughs> but, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? And you get enough of those in a day, it's like the chicken getting pecked. Same kind of illustration. That chicken's going to fall over dead on the 99th. So did that happen in your house this morning? <laughs> okay. All right, now, where was I here? Oh, back to the scriptures. Lord, who would stand if you, if you kept an account? And see, I, I could have kept an account, but because of my lesson, it reminded me, don't keep accounts. I do not keep an account. I have never. When I first got married, I thought about it, but it never worked. So I just, I don't do that. I don't keep an account. Besides, she's always right. So anyway, John 15, 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Now, do you think the Father loved Jesus? Do you really think he loved Jesus? Jesus, do you think he's telling the truth? Jesus says he loves you the same way. Oh, that's something worth meditating on. Jesus loves me the same way his father loved him. He's not going to lie to me. John 15, 17. These things I command you that you love one another. Jesus loves me, and he says, well, because I love you, I want you to love these people. I want you to love one another. I is that so hard to, uh, to obey because he loves me? He says, I command you. He's given us a command. If you don't take his command and obey it, how can he be your Lord? If he tells you to love somebody, it doesn't matter what you think about that person. He wants you to love them. You do it because he said to do it. Galatians 5, 6. You know, we're supposed to live by faith. Okay, the bottom of that. But faith works by love. Without love, your faith doesn't work. If your faith doesn't work, you can't please God. If your faith doesn't work, nothing works. You just come to church. Just get the best you can. Do the best you can. Romans 13, 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. He that loves one another has fulfilled the law. How would you like to fulfill the whole law? Christians today are trying to fulfill the law through their own efforts, and all they got to do is love God and love the other person. 
There, you've done it. You fulfilled the law. That's simple. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, steal, bear false witness, not covet. And you can wrap all those up in loving your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to kill him, you're not going to commit adultery, you're not going to steal from him, you're not going to lie to him. Love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Matthew 5.44, now here's a hard one. Love your enemies. Jesus is going pretty far when he says love your enemies. You know, sometimes we think our enemies are right here in the church. And we can't even get past that part to get out and love our enemies. Love your enemies. He makes, he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. That means he treats them good just like he treats us good. We might as well treat them good. It's his idea to love your enemies. Romans 12, 19. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto the wrath. Here's a tough one right here. It's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, you should heap coals of fire on his head. He tells us to love one another because he loves us. And it's hard sometimes to love one another is what we think. But then he tells us to love our enemies. It gets even harder. But then he tells us, do not take revenge. Do not avenge yourselves. Last week, I don't watch TV. Every now and then I'll sit down. I'll watch about 10 minutes of television at a time. And I caught one by Charles Bronson last week. Somebody killed his daughter. So the rest of the program, apparently he was killing all these people one at a time. And I have to admit, I enjoyed it. It's in me. I like that stuff. Men like that stuff. Men like war. I saw one with Clint Eastwood. And again, I just watched a little bit here, go away, come back, watch a little bit. Clint Eastwood, <laughs> I guess I don't have to tell you, he, he came into town, he got, ins he got insulted, but he said it was his donkey that was insulted. So he wanted these guys to apologize to his donkey. They wouldn't do it. So he killed them. I have to admit, I kind of enjoyed it. And I know I'm not supposed to. And I don't spend my time watching TV. But there's a little bit of that old stuff left in there. Mm. Now see, I'm on, I'm on a message of love. Clint Eastwood was not on him. He was not into love. But see, that's entertainment. And that's the world. You know, you can choose the world or you can choose God's side because that side doesn't work. It may give a little bit of a feel-good for a little while, but that's it. That's the end of it. It's over. But you get on God's side, and there's, there is a reward. The last thing I'm going to share with you t today is I'm going to show you, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But just before I get there, um, now I just read the Word of God. And you may have picked up on some of it, and some of it may have went over your head, because we're all, you're tired. I can see it. And you're hungry. But here's the word of God, and when the, when the clock gets, gets to 1 o'clock, we're out of here. But for right now, here's the word of God. You may say to yourself, and you may not admit to yourself, well, I don't care what the Bible says. When it says to love my enemies, I don't care. You don't understand my enemy. Or you want me to love this guy? You don't realize what he did to me. And I know that. that that's that human nature. We had, a, we had a deacon's meeting at a church I used to go to, and I was, I was the youngest deacon. And every time I'd go to these meetings, I'd get my heart or my chest would get tight because I knew it was going to be a strife meeting. So I'd go in there, and one time we went in there, and the pastor, he wasn't in strife. I, I appreciated the pastor. And, you know, I was there for God. You know, what are we going to get done here for God? And I wanted right, but you get some of these old guys, and they're just not quite right. The, the love message didn't quite get to them. But this one guy, the pastor says, well, you know, the Bible says, da da da, and this one guy pipes up, I don't care what the Bible says, we need to fix this problem. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of an eye-opener. 
But you might be saying to yourself, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do it this way. Well, not recommended. So what is the benefit to me of walking in love as opposed to making sure I receive my dues? Um, I don't know why I got that note, but I like to give illustrations so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. I know Jesus gave illustrations. This time of year, the carpenter bees are out. And this time of year, every time this time of year, I'm out there fighting them. You know, you know, trying to kill them or do whatever I can do to them. They're eating my building. But the, a carpenter bee, they call it a hover bee, he just kind of hover right here. You've probably seen them. They look ominous, but they're not. They're just a bunch of, they're easy to defeat. And if you watch them, there'll be a little bug that come along. And he'll go after that little bug, and that little bug will take off, and he'll come back again right here. And then a bug over here, and he'll go after him. What's he doing? He's, uh, he has his rights. He don't want nobody else to mess with him. He's guarding what's his. This, this is mine. Don't come around here. And we do that. We may not realize that, but we do that too. I want to give you some examples now of, of love and action. Like I said, I, li I like examples. You know, I, I was sitting in Sunday school and I thought to myself, you know, I'm not the message. I'm just a container. And I don't have to worry about what comes out of me because I prayed. Missy's prayed. Pastor Bob's prayed. People prayed for me. And this is not an easy thing for me. But God is easy. The word is easy. And I'm just, I'm just telling you from my heart what's going on. But my neighbor has a bunch of dogs. I like dogs as long as they're not mine. And my neighbor on this side has a dog. I go out in my backyard, and this dog starts yelping at me. And I'm thinking, this is my yard. Don't, don't bark at me. I don't know why they can't understand that. But they're barking at me in my yard. I've done that. I've done everything. I used to play ball years ago. I used to play ball with the dogs. A little tiny BB, a little ball. <laughs> I'd throw it, they'd catch it. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. My hair, was, my hair was dark brown last time I did that. But there's another way to deal with that, and it's called love. So now when the dogs bark at me, I really pulled one on them. I had Missy buy me a box of dog biscuits. So now I throw them dog biscuits. So I'm making peace with them, and I'm doing it in a loving way. So now they don't bark at me anymore. I go out there and I rake my leaves, and it's quiet, and they're looking at me, and they're not saying nothing. And that's exactly the way I like it. So see, I overcame with love. The things in my head, what I wanted to do to, do to those dogs, it wouldn't have been good if they found out that I was the one that did it. But that's, that's what I'm thinking. And that's, I went out to California. My mother's got the same problem. She's got these dogs on the other side of the fence. Can't see her. She can't see them. Every time she opens the door, they start barking. And I looked over the fence to look at these dogs. And I'd never seen a meaner bulldog in my whole life. You ever seen a dog just look at you and look through you? This dog was mean. There's two of them. I said, Mom, I don't know if it'll work, but let me get you a, a box of dog biscuits. <laughs> so every time that dog start barking, attack the fence, would be doing this number. And my mom's just going out there to dump trash. I said, Mom, every time that happens, just take a biscuit, throw it over there. So she did that. She don't hear nothing anymore. <laughs> so it works. So instead of hurting the dog, cursing the dog, getting mad at the neighbor, yelling at the neighbor, cussing, calling the dog pound, throwing bricks at the dog, throw the dog a bone. <laughs> it works every time. That's love. You know that movie Fireproof? I, I just watched a piece of that. Like I said, I don't watch movies. I watched a piece of it, and it reminded me, and I, I watched how this guy was trying to win his wife back, and everything he did, she rejected. Everything. But 
it was years ago that I saw the whole thing, but I think he wanted to buy a big fancy fishing boat, and what he did is he bought her mother a hospital bed instead. And when she realized what he had done, because she thought it was her new friend doing that, but he was a jerk, it wasn't him, it was her husband. And what she did is she saw his love, and that made all the difference in the world. He showed just because love. One more story, and then my big story. Um, we had a cat years ago. His name was Sam. When Sam was a little kitten, I think Missy brought him home, and we put him out front, and I don't know why, this is not significant, but he jumped up on my tire. And when I was young and acting like I said I, I used to act, I wasn't bad, but I was, anyway. So I decided, and I knew people that would throw cats up and see them land on their feet, and that was me way, way, way back when. But I like cats. But I decided, I, I made a decision when I saw this cat, I'm going to be nice to this cat. This cat was the best friend I ever had. This cat was, he, he, Sam was Sam, right? Rachel was in love with him. Leah was in love with him. He slept with Rachel. But Sam, you know how you put your hand, why am I, is this part, yeah, this part of the lesson. I put my, my, your hand on a cat's face and they'd grab you and then they'd, they'd kick you with their feet. You do that to Sam, just playing with him, and you go, ow! And he'd stop, he'd, okay. He'd, he'd lighten up. You'd walk in a room, hey, Sam. He'd say something to you. You'd walk by Sam, and he'd, he'd reach a hand out and do this to you because he loved us. And that's the only cat that I ever tried to love and show love to him, and it made a difference. And I can love my neighbor's dogs. I can love my fellow brethren. I can love my enemies. Now, this is about love. The best example, let me, let me try to, this is the gist of what I'm trying to get at. You can get in the love walk, and it'll change your life. But you've got to give up. You know, if so-and-so did such and such to me, I don't have to forgive them, and I'm going to get them someday or some way, and I'm not going to forgive them, you can live that life if you want to, but that's a life that'll lead to death. It, it'll, it'll take a toll on your body. It'll take a toll on your mind. It'll hurt you. It'll mess you up. Now, Missy told me don't read anything, but I've got to read this. This is worth reading. Charles, you got that picture? I've got to read this book. This is what he wrote. I didn't know this guy a year ago, didn't even know about these people, but I, I read his book called Happy, 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 <laughs> and this is the truth. I, I, I read books at night before I go to sleep, and I'll drop the book off the side of my bed. Next day, I'll pick it up, get another chapter. When I read this chapter, it's like the glow just stayed in my bedroom. So when I go to bed at night, even today, two months later, it's like there's a glow in there. Okay, maybe it's my imagination. But I enjoyed it that much that when I go to bed now, I think about Phil Robertson. Well, let me read this to you, and I'll, I'll try to be brief with it. Okay. Phil Robertson, he was a scoundrel before he got saved, when he had his bar and he had his wife cooking food for the bar, and he got mad at people and he beat up the bar owner. The guy that was renting to him, he had to spend four months out in the swamp hiding from the police. He changed. He got saved. So this is an experience that he, uh, he shares about one day. He lives on the Wachita River there in Louisiana. And at one time, he was a commercial fisherman. He made his livelihood catching fish and selling them. And he said sometimes he had over 100 hoop lines or hoop nets and trot lines uh, stretching all the way across the Wachita River. But these pirates on the river kept stealing his fish. Now, people in Louisiana have been shot for doing that. Um, 
And it might make sense to you if you think that that's, that's their livelihood. This is how the man was making his living. When I saw people stealing my fish, I'd run them down with my shotgun, and I'd scare the daylights out of them. It didn't do much good, though, and they kept stealing from me, but I kept scaring them, and I was making enemies up and down the river. There's, he said they were probably saying, that old sucker down there, he, he's about as mean as a junkyard dog. But he kept reading and studying his Bible while the stealing continued unabated. Charles, if you put Romans 12, 17 up there. And he was reading Romans 12, 17 one night. And then after the scripture, put his picture back there for effect. He was reading how the Bible says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. He says, but be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And it says in there, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Keep that in mind. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. All right, go back to the picture, Charles. He says, I, I read that verse and I sat there thinking, there ain't no way that's going to work. No way. Be good to them, but Lord, they're stealing from me. But then I had a revelation. Hey, wait a minute. I, I've never tried that. I keep running them off with my shotgun. It honestly made no sense to me, but I was going to try the Lord's way. So I decided the next time I saw someone lifting one of my nets, I would initiate the biblical way of dealing with them. So people were stealing his nets, and he had to deal with them. He used a shotgun. But now instead of his shotgun, now he's going to use the Bible way of dealing with them. Let's see what happens. I was going to be good to him. Sure enough, I walked out one day and heard a motor running. I looked and saw some guys pulling up one of my nets. I stood there and watched them for a few minutes. My boat was parked right on the riverbank, and I took off running and jumped in it. I had my shotgun with me. So you see right here the picture, every, nothing's changed. He's watching them. Yep, they're stealing my nets again, stealing my fish. There's his boat. He's got his shotgun. He ran to the boat. David ran to Goliath. He ran to the boat, jumped in. He's got his shotgun. I was going to try God's way, but my faith was still a little bit weak. So I had my shotgun as insurance. I was going to try to be good to them, but if they wanted to get mean, I had to survive. So I ran out on the river, and these guys were still coming up with my nets. I cruised right up on them. They saw me coming, dropped the net, and threw the float back into the water and started fishing. Lie. I added that. They were lying. Hey, what are y'all doing? I shouted. Oh, we're just trying to catch a few fish, one of them told me. What were you doing with that net in your hand? I asked him. And what I like so much about Phil is he ain't cutting no slack. They're liars and they're thieves, and he, he's catch, he's, that's exactly what you guys are. You, you, you're thieves. You're stealing. He wasn't going around like, well, what are you doing? He, he, he's addressing the problem. Well, you know, he said as he started to stutter and mumble, what's that? What is that? Is that what that is? Is that what that is? Y'all know what's on the other end of that float. Then I changed my tactics. So now he realized, now he, he's approached him in the same way he always has, the same way we approach people when they offend us, the same way nothing's changed, but he's already had a conversation with God. He's already saw what the word said about how to deal with people. And now he says, then I changed my tactics. This is where it gets good. In a cheerful and exuberant voice, I shouted, good times have come your way. They looked at me, wondering exactly what I was up to. 
I still had my hand on my Browning A5 shotgun. What? One of them asked. Good times have come your way, I said again. I'm going to give them to you. You were going to steal my fish. Evidently, you planned a fish fry, but y'all aren't catching any. But you want a fish fry. Since you didn't catch him, you're going to steal him. Well, here's the good news. I'm going to give you what you were trying to steal free of charge. No, we were just going to, one of them started to say, but I cut him off. Nope, you want a fish fry, I said. We're going to have us a fish fry. How many people you got coming? <laughs> I like old Phil. I reached over and grabbed the rope on the net and told him to keep their boat right there. Let's see what y'all were fixing to catch, I said. I raised my net up and looked in it. Woo, y'all would have done pretty good, I said. I'm enjoying this. You guys enjoying this? All right. All right. I'm enjoying it again. By then, I'm sure they figured I was certifiably nuts. I got a lot of fish in here, I said. Get your boat over here. They started paddling and were watching me, probably to make sure I wasn't going to shoot them. I dumped the fish from my net into my boat and told them to bring their boat closer. I began throwing even more fish into their boat. What about this big white perch here, I asked them. I'm probably supposed to throw him back. What do you all think? No, we'll, we'll, we'll keep him, one of them said. I think that might have been an illegal fish. I don't know. The fish kept hitting the bottom of the men's boat, and they kept watching me throw them over. Finally, one of them protested mildly, saying, I, I, I think that's probably enough. Look, you start frying fish and kinfolk will start showing up who haven't been around in months, I told them. Let's make sure you have enough. So I threw all of my fish into their boat. Now, y'all got plenty, I said. Y yes, sir, that's, that's plenty, one of them replied. Now, here's the deal, I told them. Why steal something if you can get it for free? Man, look, we're, we're sorry, one of them said. I understand. Look, I live right over there. From now on, just come up there if you ain't catching anything. I'll give you all the fish. That way you won't have to steal. You get your fish. You're happy. Everybody's happy, happy, happy. I let the net back down in the river and said, good to see y'all. The men pulled away in their boat and started motoring down the river. They had plenty of fish. They were looking back at me, probably thinking, is this guy for real? Maybe they remembered I had a shotgun and were about half scared, but I never saw them again. After that episode, everyone quit stealing from me. Hmm. Did it God's way. After that, everyone quit stealing from me. Every time I saw someone eyeing my nets, I'd offer them free fish. I was giving away less fish than what was previously being stolen from me. What a deal when you do it God's way. I reread the text from Romans 12, and I thought, you know what? I get it. What the Almighty is saying is that no matter how sorry and low down somebody might be, everybody's worth something. But you're never going to turn them if you're as evil as they are. If you're good to them, you might appeal to their conscience if they have any conscience. Now, there are some people who might be so mean you, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't be good to them. But most people are perplexed after someone is good to them when he should have been mean. And I thought about God. God should have been mean to us. Go to hell. But he wasn't mean to us. And so we're perplexed when we hear about the love of God. Why is he being so good to me? What have I done? Why would he be so good to me? Most of the time they end up giving up their evil ways. The Almighty was right, as he always is. Did you enjoy that as much as I did? <laughs> Just because God said so, and Phil decided to do it the way God said, and God worked it out perfect to everybody's best interest, Especially to Phil. Phil don't have to go running up with a shotgun anymore. But you know, wherever you work and wherever you live, 
you may have a situation just like that. And Phil, he took a big step. Giving away his fish, that's his livelihood. You know, maybe we got to give, give up something that is precious to us. Like the boy with, with the lunch, he gave that lunch to Jesus, and look what Jesus did with it. He gave them fish to his enemy, basically, and look what God did. Nobody's stealing from him anymore. He's enjoying life. He's now a millionaire. He wasn't a millionaire back then, but it just seems to work. Look at this here. When you do it God's way, it just works. It just works, and it's like we got to make up our mind like, I was going to say, and I, I didn't finish, but you may have something going on at work that this knucklehead over in the corner is ruining my life. Why is he doing that? And then you get, well, I'm not going to talk to him. I'm not going to answer him when he needs an answer. I got this message, but I'm not going to give it to him. You do all these things all day long, all week long, all month long to get back at him, and what you're doing is you're heaping on yourself. And so do what Phil did, because Phil did what Jesus did. And I, I, I'm reminded of, of Peter. He got all them fish. But we've got to make up our mind to do something on purpose, in love, to somebody who's an enemy so that God can set us free. And then he may set that person free too. Thank you.